So this is our second recording for Hidden Histories, Women of Waterloo. And today we're joined by Katrina Kennedy and Julia Bannister, who are gonna be sharing some of their research and knowledge with us. So um, if you guys could introduce yourselves to us and tell us a bit more about what your research background is. So Katrina. Hello, um, my name is Katrina Kennedy. I'm a lecturer in um, modern British and Irish history at the University of York, um, but I have particular interests in the history of the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, as well as in women's history. Um, so this project very much can, helps connect together those two interests. And Julia. Hello, I'm Julia Bannister. I'm a lecturer in English literature at Leeds Beckett University, and I really work on the literature and culture of the long 18th century. So going back to the sort of earlier past this period, but coming into the revolutionary period towards the end, and I'm interested in militarism and gender. I've done a bit of work on masculinity, but I'm also interested in femininity and women's experiences of war. What do we tend to find that tells us about these women's experiences? Yes, I mean, the, the, one of the main sources for um, learning about women's experiences during these wars is probably um, soldiers' memoirs. Um, so famously, the, um, the Napoleonic Wars is one of the um, most written about um, wars um, up to this point, um, you know, and it's not until the First World War um, that there are as many accounts of a battle as there are of Waterloo. Um, so um, there's a real proliferation of soldiers of all ranks writing about their experiences and writing about the everyday life on campaigns. So they're wonderfully rich resources. Um, for um, understanding regimental life, but also for glimpses into the roles that um, women play um, on campaigns. So they're, you know, soldiers are often writing about the women um, that are following the regiment. Uh, so that's a really rich um, source. And then there are some, when I wrote um, uh, a book about writing about the Napoleonic War, so looking at soldiers' letters and diaries and memoirs, um, I really wanted to find um, accounts by ordinary women um, who were camp followers, who were on campaign. And uh, when I wrote the book, I said, oh, I don't think there are any. And I just, I looked, I couldn't find any. And then just in recent years, um, I, I, a few more, accounts by women themselves from um, the, you know, the, the, um, the rank and file rather than more elite women um, have emerged. So we might have a, uh, an opportunity to discuss those in a little bit more depth because they're, they're really interesting, those, uh, and quite rare to find. Yeah, I can add on to that because I think going back into the 18th century, it's hard to find authentic accounts of women's experiences of war. Um, in the 18th century, this topic is treated as something of an of a interest, but in a kind of curiosity way, um, as a novelty. There are two really important accounts of women who claim to have been at war, one from right at the start of the 18th century, um, it's the life of a woman called Christian Davis, and then one from the mid-century, the life of a woman called Hannah Snell. And those are accounts that are presented, they're in published, they're published and printed, and they're presented as accounts written by those women themselves. But both of them are accounts which read more like a novel, the way that they're written, the kinds of things that are included. It's hard to say where the balance of fact and fiction lies with those two things. So in contrast, moving up to the Napoleonic period, the emergence, as Katrina says, of um, journals, of memoirs, it becomes, you know, that becomes a, a, a big um, category of writing that really blossoms in the Napoleonic period. That's a really, it becomes a place where it's really possible to start tracing ordinary women's experiences of war. With some of the newspaper articles and, and things like that, when women appear in those, some of the ones that I've seen tend to have been written quite a long time after mm -hmm. the, after the battle. How do we treat those kinds of accounts do we take them at face value or do we um 
wonder how the intervening years might have affected um, how these women are recalling the events. Yes, it's a really good question. And it's one that holds true for, I suppose, all war memoirs, you know, that are, are often written maybe um, 30, 40 years after the events they describe. Um, so um, often you're not reading necessarily a, a, an accurate account of the experience but in some ways there's a lot of truth that emerges from that because they're remembering um emotionally significant moments so certainly um an account like Catherine Exley's um so this is one of the um, um most interesting I think um uh, accounts of a camp follower in the peninsula campaign and that's written several decades um, after the experiences she she recounts, um, and what do, what you do note there is that her um, account of the actual campaign itself is a little bit garbled, so she doesn't necessarily get the dates of the battles right, or she can't remember, you know, what the cities they were passing through in Spain and Portugal um, were. But then you get these really evocative passages where she's talking about moments of um, great fear, you know, um, where she fears that her husband has died or uh, when her children become ill. Um, so you, there is... Um, I suppose a lot of emotional truth that comes through it, even if, you know, the actual sequence of events might be, um, you know, a bit, a bit garbled. You, you're getting some insight into how it felt to be on campaign. And clearly these are experiences that were so um, novel in a way, you know, going abroad, enduring all these hardships with her husband and the regiment um, that uh, they, you know, were kind of impressed on her you know that she you know that the, the was able to recount in quite a lot of a detail certain scenes certain um episodes in in that um campaign so yeah it's not uh, an absolutely factual record um but I think there's a lot still that we can draw from it and it's in their own words as well isn't it mm -hmm. I mean I suppose of the people um who were writing at the time, like some of the soldiers, people like Ned Costello and those mm. uh, prolific letter writers, um, they may have been writing at the time with better recall of battles and dates and actual sequences of events. But of course they were writing about these women, not speaking from their own experience. Yes, and often you find with some of those, the later memoirs, what they're doing is when they're writing about the battle, what they've actually done is they've um, read other memoirs or other histories <laughs> written by, um, you know, the, the historians of these wars that, you know, are emerging in the in the decades afterwards. And so you'll have their very interesting recollections. And then when it comes to actually describing a battle, you know that they've just taken it directly from William Napier or one of the other kind of historians um, of uh, um, Wellington's campaigns. So actually where the material in any of these sources is most interesting is not when they're talking about the big events, which after all, as a soldier or someone who was there, you never really have a, a, you know, a full appreciation of what's going on. You know, it's the uh, the confusion, the smoke, the, you know, the battlefield uh, just won't allow for that. This is a kind of, as a, you know, a, um, a worm's eye view of battle rather than a, a, a kind of bird's eye, you know, Olympian view of what's going on. So um, actually it's, they're much more interesting those kinds of sources when they're talking about um, relationships and daily life and so on. The, when, often when they're talking about the big events, when they tend to um, just return to these more official sources or these official histories to provide a narrative. I think, Julia, that sounds like it, it, it links really well to how you look at the sources as well, because you talked about where there's a Kind of uncertainty about how much fact and how much fiction is in the sources that you're looking at so 
thinking about your examples, do you see the same sorts of themes coming up as well? Absolutely. And I think that question of what did, what to make of a source that was written a sort of long time after really goes in with another question, which is, well, what was the person's reason for writing that source in the first place and how overt is that? Sometimes that's not overt, but is it a source that's written with the intention of being published, perhaps making some money in some way? Um, I'll go back to that um, account from the mid 18th century by Hannah Snell. Hannah Snell, um, after that was published, very briefly took to the stage and had a kind of stage act where she performed as a soldier, even though her actual military experience had been in the Navy. So she'd kind of been a sailor. And, but she performed as a soldier and it didn't last very long, maybe a couple of years, but there was some sort of, she'd obviously seen some way to capitalise on her experience in that case. Um, but maybe something in contrast, like the Diary of Catherine Exley, it's not quite clear that there's any sort of financial motive or interest in publishing that. Um, and that's a really interesting case where the time difference is really apparent because in a way you can hear that older voice in the diary in some of the ways that it's overlaid kind of her account of her experiences are overlaid with a religious kind of narrative a way to she has sort of religious intention to make sense of of this whole experience for her for herself um and in some ways i think that it is it's kind of that older voice is apparent at the start as well i think she mentioned something at the beginning about um wishing that she'd had a mother to guide her and to um, give her as, as if somehow she wouldn't have wouldn't have gone into that life if she'd had some better sort of advice someone a, a female figure around her to tell her not to do it um, I'm not sure and yet when she gets into her narrative she's clearly she's clearly remembered it and wants this thing to be known wants people to know about the experiences that she's had um, so, yeah, I think there's really interesting questions around what to do with sources when they're written a bit later or why are they written? What was the purpose of that person's purpose for writing it? Is this a good point that Julia raises about um, Catherine Exley's diary as a kind of spiritual narrative yeah. almost because she does, um, while she's on campaign, um, she um, uh, finds a Methodist group in Ireland, uh, mm -hmm. or so it's while well, she's still following the regiment, and um, you know that this kind of um, reignites a kind of spiritual um, devotion in her. And like a lot of soldiers, you know, in, in um, the army at this time who did become closely involved with Methodist um, groups and then went on to write these very religiously inspired um, memoirs. So partly then what the her diary is about is showing the various ways in which God you know, protected her and her husband, mm -hmm. you know, during the course of their campaigns. So that that's often, um, you know, one of the motivations, I suppose, for writing is to show um, that, uh, um, I, I suppose, to narrate a life where uh, God has seemed to intervene at perilous moments. Um, uh, and also, you know, it's within this kind of broader tradition of, of religious war writing um that certainly a lot of the memoirs for, of the napoleonic wars are in that um tradi literary tradition so how did um catherine exley's words come to us how are we able to read them now am i right in thinking that they were initially found due to something to do with a newspaper is that how the story actually came to us? That's what I'm sort of curious about with like, how, how did we actually, make, so many of these stories um, have remained quite hidden, but hers, you can actually, you can actually buy Kathleen Exley's diaries as a, as a published book, which is very unusual, isn't it? Yeah, so I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. So it was originally um, published, I think by a local, you know, so she was from Leeds, um uh she came from uh yeah so she, she, she was from yorkshire and i think th they must have been found i'm just trying to remind myself of what the uh the story is but they, they were serialized i think she had written them up um and then uh they must have been found 
um, maybe by her descendants. They were serialized um, in local news newspapers, the Dewsbury Reporter and so on. And then I think kind of, yeah, were forgotten about. This is why I, when I was writing my book, I had no idea about these. And then I think just, again, some descendants who were interested in this story of their ancestor who had, you know, been on the Peninsula campaign. Um, they uh, set about publishing a new edition um, of her, um, uh, uh, you know, of her narrative that was only published a few years ago. But I absolutely think that interest in, I, you know, this is what I, I hadn't realised, but I probably should have done a bit more digging into local newspapers because they are a treasure trove for these sorts of um more forgotten history. So another one um, that I hadn't been aware of until um, relatively recently um, was uh, the story of Jenny Jones, a Welsh woman who was at Waterloo, who told her story um, to the, the Cambrian News in 1876. And at this time, of course, she must have been nearly hundred I think when she was uh, um, narrating her or maybe not quite that old but in her 80s or 90s and she um, the uh, the local newspaper had searched her out and that's quite common again at that point in the um, 1860s 1870s that point when uh, the generation who had fought at Waterloo, uh, they're reaching the ends of their life or they're, you know, the last remaining survivors are still around. And that kind of prompts um, this uh, um, intensified search for the last survivors and to write down their stories before they're lost. So there's a few women who definitely are included in that um, kind of burst of interest in the memory of Waterloo and the last survivors. I suppose Catherine is interesting as well, isn't she? Because she was literate and so she could literally mm. tell her own story in her own words whereas people like Jenny Jones were they telling their story to somebody else or was she writing it down herself or it's not clear but it seems that she was um uh, uh, narrating it to the the reporters who knew of this woman who had been at Waterloo um you know and who lived locally and then went to interview her and I think from the account she she probably uh, um you know spoke was speaking to, to them in Welsh um as well she spoke both Welsh and English but um you know that she had married a Welshman and become that's she had gone to Waterloo with the Welsh regiment and then settled um, in a Welsh speaking part of the country. Julia, it sounds like your examples are, are more published works, so mm -hmm. there's a slightly different attitude earlier. Is there, do you think there's a reason behind that? Oh, um, I suppose only to the extent that, that um, the interest in men's men's memoirs and journals hasn't really developed in the sort of broader 18th century um, yet. So, and I think when women women's memoirs are, or, or counts of women in some kind of warfare situation, it's seen as, as a novelty factor, as something that is remarkable. Um, and I mean, in the 18th century, there's still a lot of interest, for example, in um, historical ideas of Amazonian women warriors, these kinds of almost sort of legends of women warriors um it's not it's not really tied up with the things that are necessarily actually happening in the period in terms of the actual wars mm. and i guess that does follow through to some of the accounts that we hear from soldiers mainly i guess about women fighting at the battle of waterloo i guess that there's, there's still that interest in mm. in women who are a bit different that Amazonian idea women who are a bit um we're like breaking breaking a mold in some way I guess and I guess it's good copy as well isn't it it's a it's um it's a good story for for a publisher to tell um 
of this story of a, a woman disguising herself. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's actually an important point, I guess, that those sort of 18th century stories that I mentioned, the two important ones, are both examples where women um, went to war as men, so they cross-dressed and went as men. So that's a kind of an important aspect of the stories, which is not at all similar to later accounts, the kinds of things we're talking about with Catherine Exley's diary, where she, she wasn't there in some sort of disguise. She was just there as a woman in 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 a war zone, basically. Mm. Well, I think sometimes those cases are a bit more uh, complicated in terms of gender as well and how those mm. stories are told. Um, it's just made me think of Alexander Jurov, who fought with the Russian army um, in the Napoleonic period. And... Um, the way his story was later told by um, Pushkin, who essentially wanted to tell the story of Nadezhda Jurova, who then fought in disguise as a man, whereas mm. looking over it now, it does look as if it's perhaps a bit more of a complicated mm. situation, but that Pushkin has perhaps picked up on um, a bit of a, you know, an exciting story. It's like a, you know, it's a, a good bit of um, uh, salacious gossip, isn't it, I suppose? Whereas the stories of the women that were following the ordinary soldiers, perhaps, I don't know, mm. would you say they would receive less attention um, than some of the other stories we hear from the period? Yes, no, I mean, I'd absolutely say that the, the, the kind of cultural fascination with what were seen as cross-dressing soldiers or, you know, um, women disguised, which you, of course you get in, there's lots, there's a very rich folk ballad tradition around that, um, whether it's the, you know, folk songs about uh, women who can't bear to be parted from their lovers who will um, en enlist as a soldier so that they can accompany them. Um, and also I think historians have been, you know, particularly interested in, in these figures as well, because, um, you know, they are seen as pushing back against entrenched gender roles. Uh, they are kind of transgressive and interesting, but they're only ever would have been a very small minority of the kind of the women who went to war, um, whereas actually we have a very sizable um, proportion of, uh, of you know, uh, women at war who were there as camp followers, um, you know, and that's quite, um, I suppose, certainly the, the Napoleonic Wars is just at the end of a period when it would have been quite normal in early modern warfare, so through the 17th and 18th centuries, to have a large, you know, contingent of people providing support services to the army, cooking, washing, all of that. Um, so it's, you know, it was not uncommon to see women in war zones or following an army. Um, it'll become less common going into the, to the 19th century for the British Army. And I wonder if some of the um, interest in those exceptional cases, women who've cross-dressed, women who've um, participated in, in warfare in that way, is, some, is sometimes about distracting or diverting attention from that main bulk of women who mm. might have been somewhere in and around a battlefield. Um, I'm thinking of um, uh, General Burgoyne's account of the siege of Saratoga in the War of American Independence, which was a kind of campaign that didn't go very well for the British. Um, and in his later, right, he wrote about this at length in a way to try to exonerate himself really from his part in it. Um, he mentions at one point that people have said that there were 2000 women with the army at Saratoga and that this was one of the reasons why the, the campaign had gone so badly wrong, which would have been, I mean, a, a, you know, about a third of the number of the actual army. It would have been a huge number of women. And it was being levelled, therefore, as a kind of accusation and a way of um, saying that he hadn't managed things properly, that this was one of the reasons why it all failed, because there were too many women there. So it was clearly a sort of touchy subject in some ways, how many women were there and what they were doing there and were they being managed or controlled in various ways. 
And I guess we see that carrying on in Waterloo and, and the, the sort of peninsula period where Wellington's issuing orders about what women are allowed to do and, you know, not going forward of the baggage train to to get food, for example, and those sorts of things that I guess he's he's kind of aware maybe of these sensitivities. Yeah, absolutely. Um, concerns that women might be buying up food, for example, in villages before the army has got there and they can then buy the food. So there's something, it's a strain, you know, that, the, but the very idea of giving instructions about what women should do almost acknowledges that they have a kind of role that in a way they're receiving orders like the other soldiers were, were receiving orders even though those orders are sort of trying to say well there's a difference here and these women have to be kept in in certain kinds of ways I think, well one of the things uh, that i've always found interesting is the different ways that officers memoirs talk about camp followers uh, um and the way um private soldiers talk about um these women um so there is a tendency and a lot of officers um memoirs of these wars um can be quite um condescending about the other ranks they kind of deny them I suppose, uh, um, full humanity to a certain extent. So they often talk about how callous and brutalized the other ranks are. Um, and they often point to one of the, the, the things that they point to as evidence for what war does to women is the fact that often after a battle, there will be um, these women um, uh, plundering the battlefield. Um, and, uh, you know, stalking um, through the dead to kind of um, get, you know, um, various possessions or uh, um, uh, that they can sell afterwards. Um, and the officers often describe them as moral fathoms, which is um, taken from the title of a book by the um, 18th century novelist Tobias Smollett, which describes this sort of um, uh, uh, rough woman who stalks the battlefields of Europe um, uh, and is sort of, you know, lacking in any tenderness or pity. Um, but what they don't understand, the officers, is actually these women are, are trying to, this is part of a survival strategy, you know, that they're, they're trying to, um, you know, ensure that they and their husband potentially or their family that they're with can endure and survive the rigors of campaign. And, you know, and it's an understand, you know, understood part of, you know, campaigning that you will be able to, um, you know, get some loot after the battle. And so they're, they're there kind of, you know, this part of their families. Um, strategy for uh, surviving, whereas, you know, a lot of the um, ordinary soldiers who leave memoirs write in a much more um, affectionate way, uh, often about um, about the women in the regiment, not always, but, you know, they're, they're much more understanding of the, the difficulties they're enduring, the support they provide. Do you think it would be the case that those ordinary soldiers would just have more of an understanding of the pressures that those women would be facing to get enough resources together to feed their children even, um, whereas perhaps that all just goes above the officer's head a little bit, perhaps they just are a bit unaware about that side yeah. of things. Yes, I think they're often drawing a contrast, I suppose, between women of their own class who would rarely be on or near a battlefield so for them you know they and they often use this language of um that these women are have become unsexed they've lost their natural tenderness and delicacy because um uh, of being at war um and so i think it's really you know they don't yeah understand actually that they they may well be doing things like you know that look tough because of, you know, love for their family in order to survive, you know, so these are kind of gestures of tenderness, but the officer class can't always understand that or understand the context. And just to add on to that, it's interesting that um, 
soldiers actually do appear in quite a few pieces of feminist writing from the French Revolutionary period, this kind of late, eight, very late 18th century going into the early 19th century. Um, and sometimes, so for example, in a feminist uh, essay by someone called Mary Robinson, she writes about the way that women can endure the same level of hardship as men. And this proves that women have the same physical, but more importantly for her, mental intellectual capacities as men. Um, but in contrast, another writer, someone called Mary, uh, Hannah Moore, uh, mentions that although women should aim to be patriotic, and it's important that women should be patriotic at a time of national crisis, it's sort of disgusting. The idea that women might take up arms in the same way as women becoming politicians is all sort of disgusting to her. She doesn't want to be, doesn't want to think that she's advocating for that at all. Hmm. It's interesting how kind of gendered these roles are, aren't they? Absolutely, yeah. Well, and how subversive these women seem as well. It seems to me that mm. even at the time they were viewed as subversive. Would you say that was the case, that they were deemed to be just a little bit out there by the rest of society? But how, how did mm. people back home um, think of them? Mm. Well, I can give an example, actually, from um, a novel. Jane Austen encounters this subject in one of her novels, a novel called Persuasion. Um, it's a novel which features a number of naval characters, including a couple, Admiral Croft and his wife. Um, and there's a conversation between Admiral Croft, his wife, and her, the wife's brother, who is himself a naval officer, in which she... Kind of the Mrs. Croft um, sort of takes takes her brother to task really for his attitude to women on ships and says that actually women are just rational creatures and that any idea that they shouldn't be or couldn't spend time on ships as she herself has done. She says that she's spent years on board um, a naval ship and it's been some of the happiest times of her life. Um, that it's just a sort of um, bizarre sexist view of his that he needs to rethink Love mm. it, a bit of sound common sense from Jane Austen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting because we don't, we often don't really think of Jane Austen as writing about the military as much. She, she features, say, soldiers in her novels, but she doesn't, she's living at the time of Waterloo, but she doesn't mm -hmm. reference it. Yeah. yeah. And of course, her, you know, this, I mean, in a way, Persuasion is the novel in which she's um, write about the military most overtly, perhaps, or also um, Mansfield Park. Um, but it's a novel, she can't really take on the experience of an ordinary woman in, mm. in war. She can get there through um, a character who is an officer's wife. Um, but it is interesting that the way that she, she wants to present this, not as some sort of exceptional thing, but just as a, for, for the woman involved, as a kind of everyday um, part of her life, really. It's interesting about um, what you say about it being the everyday part of somebody's mm. life. Given that there don't seem to be that many of these stories that have come down to us, do we think that is because it was viewed as humdrum or mm. not interesting or just part of the general backdrop of life at the time that there were these women um why don't we have yeah. lots of memoirs of women who followed the drum published at around the time that that we're talking about that's such a great question um i think catherine exley and her she seems to be very aware that her account is unusual that there's it's not unusual but that, that it's it's interesting because it's something that's not often heard perhaps there's a difference between being unusual and just being not often heard i think that's her her view on it but it, is it just that women didn't have the the skills or the contacts to create text to produce them to get them into print I wonder if it's just, yeah, not having a model. I mean, this is really what happens. You can see this happening with um, uh, soldiers' memoirs, you know, um, uh, that they, you know, once one memoir appears from the um, the rank and file and is reasonably successful, a whole lot of others sort of follow in that uh, um, 
uh, mode. There is clearly a public appetite. And I suppose maybe it's something about who gets to tell war stories, mm -hmm. that it is very much identified, you know, as a male prerogative in this period. So, you know, you, you'll see all these in the 19th century, you'll often see these prints, these drawings of the, the veteran of Waterloo or uh, of these wars sitting in the pub, you know, regaling the, uh, um, you know, the punchers with his, his war stories. And of course, I suppose, you know, because these women um, haven't necessarily been fighting, that they don't maybe have the 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 right to write their stories in the same way, uh, even though of course they're fascinating stories and they have you know they have endured so much um, of the hardships of a campaign and shown immense bravery. Um, but I think that connection between fighting and writing and masculinity is a very strong one. So. What I'm getting the impression of is that in archives or in newspapers or in archives where old newspapers are held, there might be um, lots more of these stories that have just not received the attention that they might have done at the time. Um, whether that's because it wasn't seen as a very um, profitable publishing model or just because it wasn't deemed as important as as the male stories um so i'm really getting the impression that there's perhaps a bit more out there than we might mm -hmm. realize a few more stories that are yet to be that have been told but are yet to be shared yet to be shared with everybody else i think yeah i think digging in local newspapers from in the late 19th century might be a, a a really fruitful place to start to try and identify some more of these stories. Um, but I, I, I guess that there hasn't been as much of an appetite for that because there were so many memoirs published, um, you know, that people haven't really thought of looking to the newspapers um, for, uh, um, you know, accounts of these wars, because it's probably felt that there's, you know, there's, we're quite well supplied, actually, um, uh, with those stories, but, but absolutely haven't been as um, well supplied with stories from women. Are there any particular examples that you kind of enjoyed researching? Well, I think, I think the Ka Catherine Exley, just because, you know, she, um, has left you know did leave such a a full account but you know she her um uh, narrative is heartbreaking in lots of ways you know because she um you know she endures such kind of suffering but it's also very illuminating i suppose about just what women um, were prepared to do in order to follow, accompany their husband. So, you know, she marries her husband and very shortly afterwards he's sent overseas, um, you know, to the peninsula where she follows him. Um, and she gives birth to several children mm -hmm. um, while she's on campaign um, uh, and, you know, loses several children as well um, on campaign. Um, but these, you know, in her, her narrative, you get this real sense of her um, having to um, march incredible distances, sometimes, you know, um, barefoot. Uh, at one point, she, she talks about having a pair of um, boots that she hasn't taken off for three months, and then she has to um, take her husband's regimental shoes. So if you can imagine just having how agonizing it must be having, you know, a, a pair of shoes, you know, not at all tailored to your uh, feet and doing these incredible distances, um, often carrying a child on her back, fording rivers, um, sleeping out um, in the, the cold and wet, climbing through the, uh, the Pyrenees as, they cro as they're crossing from Spain into France, doing this incredible ascent um, uh, across the, the, the Pyrenees. Um, so it's really, you know, that sense of um, just the bravery, the courage, uh, you know, that it takes to 
um, follow her husband. Um, and also, I suppose, you know, how much she had to kind of shift for herself um, on um, the campaign, you know, and try and often was left with, without food. So although women were entitled, you know, women who were officially with the regiment were supposed to get half the rations um, of their, um, of, that the men would get. Um, but clearly that often didn't happen that regularly. And even if they had had, you know, the rash, half of um, the rations, um, you know, it's been estimated that the rations for soldiers in Wellington's army um, only gave about two and a half thousand calories a day and they were doing 15 mile marches so it you know it, as it has been noted that would, wouldn't have been enough to keep these soldiers going so they really need the additional food that you know the camp followers might be able to to forage for or secure for them but if you think if if you're only getting half of those rations, so um, 1,200 calories, and you're doing this intense exercise as well, you know, it's just, you know, so clearly the, she gives an account of, you know, just how malnourished and how vulnerable to illness um, she is, you know, she suffers from dysentery um, at one point when they haven't been able to eat for a long time. Um, you know, they uh, after about a week or so, when they do finally get food, um, they um, her limbs begin to swell up, which is a kind of edema, a swelling um, that is a result from from of eating when you've been severely malnourished. It's the body's response to that so um yeah in the, there's a, a lot of detail about just the the rigors um that they're sharing you know with their uh, with the men on campaign just i suppose it just really shines a light on what a hard life it, it was that mm -hmm. the majority of these women must have led Yes, and you just, yeah, I mean, reading it, you just think how, why didn't she go home, I think, as a various voice, because that would have, you know, there, mm. there, that would have been um, an option to try and get home. But there's a real sense, you know, from, uh, um, and that comes through in um, soldiers' memoirs as well, often, you know, how devoted um, a lot of women are and how the sacrifices they make to try and hold a family unit together, I suppose, um, under these very, very extreme circumstances. Do we think there's anything missing from the account? So is, are there any sort of elements of life that we just don't get an insight into, do you think? Well, I think, I mean, uh, one of the things that is noted about kind of memoirs of this period, you know, that, that, that what isn't discussed is often from, um, from men as well as women would be kind of um, accounts of sexual violence, which we probably know were, um, you know, that would have been one of the uh, um, vulnerabilities for for women camp followers you know uh, but that isn't uh, necessarily described or recorded you know there's a um, a veil of science is often drawn over that um in both the surviving accounts by women but also um uh, men's accounts julia do you have an example you'd like to share I can give an example. It's a little bit earlier than mm. um, this period, but it's an example that um, makes its way into the text I mentioned earlier, Mary Robinson's letter on women's intellectual strength. It's a, an account that Robinson quotes at some length, really, of a woman called um, Lady Harriet Ackland. Uh, and her account, her experience of war starts when she went to her follow her husband to who was in Canada for the American War. Um, she went to nurse him because he was injured, but she stayed there for a while and got caught up in a number of other campaigns. And at one point she finds out that her husband has been taken prisoner 
So she decides to go to the enemy camp, essentially, to go and look after him there. And I think that's why that narrative became one that was told and then retold by Robinson later. But interestingly, in amongst that, there are details as uh, of the hardship that she was suffering. That's not the focus of that story, but it does mention that she is... Um, She's exhausted for want of rest. She's absolutely out of food. She's been drenched for rain by 12 hours. And those sorts of details are actually very similar to the kinds of details in Catherine Exley's diary of that real physical um, privation that women might have experienced in these situations. I think that's something that can be almost quite hard to get our heads around mm -hmm. nowadays, like the, the mm -hmm. sheer physical difficulty of for example, if all your clothes and all your belongings get wet, you've either got the sun to dry them out or you've got, you know, if you're lucky, you can hang them up by a fire. But mm. I think it's that kind of thing that just makes you realise how how hard life um, must have been in general. And especially for women essentially living outdoors for a lot of the time as well. Mm. Mm. I mean, there, yeah. there are some sweeter stories. You might have one of the ones that I, I um, uh, always uh, quite liked um, are of uh, there's a story of James and Mary Anton, who were a couple um, that, uh, um, you know, accompanied each other. Um, through the Peninsula campaign. Um, but in that account from James Anton, uh, he talks about the way they really struggle to create some sense of domesticity. Um, you know, whether that that's so when they're they for you know they set up an encampment, um, he builds a hut for himself and his wife, and she'll put her, she would put her apron on the door to indicate that they weren't to be, to be disturbed. Um, and they continue to do this, you know, um, at the, as his skills in hut building improve as they kind of continue um on their journey um so uh you know eventually they get fireplace i think that's the kind of hot point to um uh 2.0 and then they finally when they end up in paris um uh they build the the best of all the huts they've had on their journey which has a little porch and it has you know a fireplace and a window that's the kind of the the, the real um cherry on top of this you know it, I suppose, attempt to create some sense of home and domesticity, even through, um, you know, the, the rigours of campaign. Um, so there's, there's kind of stories, I suppose, of um, people uh, doing their best or trying to hold on to that um, uh, uh, sense of domesticity in the most extreme circumstances. Lovely insight into mm -hmm into somebody's life really isn't it I suppose it's just a reminder that they in in many ways they were they were just like us it's quite interesting to think sometimes what would I have done if I'd have been there and I think just else as well recording I suppose it comes up in, in the memoirs and in Exley's account as well just moments of kindness you know she mm. she's very when we were talking about this, what does she remember so she remembers those really um, hard bits, but she really remembers, you know, when, say, an, uh, another soldier, when she's been separated from her husband, a soldier agrees to, takes her baby and puts it in his knapsack and carries um, that, you know, uh, him along the road for a bit. Um, she even remembers when, you know, um, you know, the soldiers of another regiment give her, you know, they're boiling a beef uh, uh, in water and they give her the washer, which I suppose would be a kind of soup by that stage. But, you know, she, she it also is very um, keen, I think, to um, note and register that, you know, amidst all this, there were there were moments of tenderness, moments of kindness. Mm -hmm. 